Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we will conclude our discussion in the hypertension series with a review of the key endocrinopathy hyperaldosteronism. Pheochromocytoma was reviewed in the presentations on MEN2. As with all recordings, a PDF is available at the 12 Days website. And as a periodic reminder, tutorial services are now being offered. Details are available at the website. Let's open our discussion by framing hyperaldosteronism in its appropriate context. You need to start developing the love of broad categories to keep your voluminous materials organized and easily retrievable come test day. So when experienced clinicians hear the term hyperaldosteronism, it is quickly thought of as being primary or secondary. And what the hell does that mean? Easy. What's the renin doing? Is renin driving the bus? Or has aldosterone gone rogue with autonomous secretion? With autonomous secretion, as seen on the right, feedback loops will suppress renin secretion. The focus of today's presentation is primary hyperaldosteronism. This category basically includes the adenoma, referred to as Kahn syndrome. We will also briefly address idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia. And for completeness, you will recall that congenital adrenal hyperplasia, characterized by 17-hydroxylase deficiency, is also associated with elevated aldosterone levels, but in this instance, it is not autonomous. Insofar as secondary etiologies, you can distinguish the two by considering whether the renin secretion is appropriate or inappropriate. Appropriate refers to renin release that occurs secondary to renal hyperperfusion, as in renal artery stenosis, or decreased effective circulating volume, and these are distinguished by blood pressure levels. And finally, rounding out the list, a rare but benign tumor of the juxtaglomerular cells, referred to as a reninoma, may present with manifestations of hyperaldosteronism. And with that background, we can begin our discussion of primary hyperaldosteronism, focusing on the adrenal adenoma. Presented here is the roadmap for our discussion. We'll open up with a review of the basic physiology. If you understand the physiology, you understand the entity and the key step one derivatives. And here's an artist's rendition of the nephron. It would be neat if the nephron came color-coded and with labels, but I show this just to target our discussion on the site of action, which is the collecting tubules. You can see that aldosterone exerts its effects by acting at two sites, the principal and alpha intercalated cells. And if you can appreciate that aldosterone drives sodium absorption with wasting of potassium and hydrogen ions, you basically understand this condition and we can focus on the tricky test derivatives. But let's first review. So here's the principal cell demonstrating the process of sodium reabsorption. Sodium flows down as the electrochemical gradient generated by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. To maintain that gradient, potassium is secreted. So what does aldosterone do? Remember, it is a steroid hormone that binds to mineralocorticoid receptors both on the plasma membrane as well as hormone receptors in the cytoplasm. Once inside the cell, it's transported into the nucleus which drives two processes, that being increased activity of the sodium potassium ATPS pumps as well as increased density of the electrochemical sodium channels. The result of this expression is a board's favorite. So what are the implications? The first is volume expansion secondary to sodium reabsorption. But remember, we are talking about hyperaldosteronism, so we are getting lots of sodium absorption, and that will be manifest as hypertension, and that makes sense. The second implication relates to renal potassium losses, so hypokalemia is the second major clue to hyperaldosterone questions. Hypertension and low potassium think hyperaldosteronism. And by the way, the question writers aren't in the business of giving away easy clues. Rather than offering a serum potassium value, they would rather use vague descriptors of hypokalemia such as muscle weakness or cramps. So don't sit around waiting for a serum potassium level in these vignettes. All right, we did say that aldosterone impacts the activity of two cell types. Let's move downstream to the intercalated cells. Recall, these cells are involved in the regulation of pH and potassium balance. The most important take home here is that aldosterone stimulates the hydrogen ATPase pump, leading to our third key manifestation. Hyperaldosteronism is associated with a metabolic alkalosis that will be expressed by elevation of the bicarb level. I do understand that normal bicarb levels are expressed by a range, but on the boards you will be looking for values higher than the normal value of 24 milliequivalents. Just for completeness, and reflecting on the hypokalemia we already discussed, what happens when the intracellular concentration of potassium is diminished? Answer, this drives the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, causing further excretion of hydrogen ions in favor of potassium absorption. 
the net result is worsening of the metabolic alkalosis. And here it is, the trifecta of hyperaldosterone secretion, hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. When you see or hear this combination, they are begging you to think hyperaldosteronism. And here is the summary for your records. So this is a key slide. What don't you see in this presentation of hyperaldosteronism? Answer, hypernatremia. The diagnostic footprints do not include the presence of a serum sodium elevation. The phenomenon by which the body avoids or corrects for hyponatremia is referred to as aldosterone escape. This is a big ticket item. And here is how this story plays out. Our body has a counter-regulatory response to everything, including the excess reabsorption of sodium. The three main adaptations include pressure naturesis, ADH, and the natriuretic peptides. Just to remind you about pressure naturesis, discussed in the introductory blood pressure regulation video, an increase in arterial pressure of only a few millimeters of mercury can markedly increase the renal output of both salt and water. The kidney literally escapes the horror of the aldosterone elevation. The two other mechanisms involved in normalizing the sodium concentration include increased ADH secretion in response to rising plasma osmolarity and release of natriuretic peptides in response to stretching of the cardiac chambers. These three mechanisms combine to regulate the plasma sodium concentration and the process is referred to as aldosterone escape. So how will this be tested on the boards? Here it is. A patient presents with muscle cramps and a very high blood pressure. The renin level is suppressed, emphasizing the autonomous secretion of aldosterone. The derivative questions relate to the electrolyte pattern. No one should struggle to identify the low potassium and high bicarb as previously discussed. The excitement comes with the sodium or piasms being one and the same. And here is your answer. A normal sodium value. This is how they will come after you with this principle. Occasionally and stupidly, they might include an elevated sodium in the question stem. If an elevation of sodium is mentioned, it reflects an abnormal response to the chronic sodium retention, but this should not be interpreted to suggest a sodium elevation is an expected manifestation in hyperaldosterone vignettes. To review this vignette, they give you a patient with cramps and weakness, i.e. a low potassium. They exclude pheo as a cause of hypertension with a negative review of systems. The blood pressure is very high, and then comes the data. A mild increase in sodium, any normal glucose, essentially excluding Cushing's in this scenario. What is the most likely cause of this presentation? And the answer is an adrenal adenoma involving the glomerulosa. And that is the major teeth of this subject. We'll finish this bad boy up in a couple of quick minutes, and then we're out of here. So in terms of diagnostics, you need a high aldosterone level and a low renin level. This is expressed by a ratio of aldo to renin of greater than 20 to 1. Sometimes the renin level may be very low, so you can have a high ratio even with a normal aldo level, so I do emphasize the need for an elevated aldosterone level as well. The other tests include a 24-hour urine collection and or adrenal vein sampling. Insofar as the urine collection, it is completed after the patient is loaded with either salt or saline. This makes physiologic sense as the goal is to suppress renin, eliminating secondary hyperaldosteronism. Adrenal vein sampling is generally pursued to confirm glandular hyperfunction when surgical management is being considered. If hypersecretion of aldosterone is confirmed, imaging is pursued including either CT or MRI. And here is your differential diagnosis, adenoma versus idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia. Historically, adenoma was seen more commonly, but with increased awareness and testing, adrenal hyperplasia is now reported more commonly. And just to put this entity to rest, in idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia, the adrenal gland behaves like it has lots of tiny adenomas. On the boards, the distinction is irrelevant. The only implication relates to therapeutics. Both entities will be treated with medications, but only the adenoma may be surgically excised if refractory to medical therapy. And insofar as medical therapeutics, not too much excitement. Aldosterone receptor antagonists for a hyperaldosterone state. Makes sense. Be familiar with both spironolactone and aplirinone as treatment alternatives. And remember, we are talking about autonomous secretion, so use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs, tempting as they might be, do not have a primary role as aldosterone production is autonomous and not related to angiotensin II. All right, we're on the home stretch, but it's worth looking at these three quick but loose associations. First, be aware that hyperkalemia can directly stimulate aldosterone secretion through upregulation of aldosterone synthase. Big whoop, this is just an FYI. 
More importantly, you need to be aware that cortisol can bind the mineralocorticoid receptor. Under normal circumstances, this is not clinically relevant as cortisol is readily metabolized by local tissues into inactive metabolites. However, in Cushing syndrome with high cortisol levels, the mineralocorticoid effect outstrips the deactivation and we see the same properties of hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis as seen in hyperaldosteronism. And finally, while we're in the neighborhood, adrenal failure has the opposite effect. Hypotension, hyperkalemia, and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. The only difference is the presence of hyponatremia due to failure of aldosterone and release of ADH. So just as hypertension with low potassium and high bicarb should clue you into thinking about hyperaldosteronism, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis should clue you into thinking about primary adrenal failure. And that, my friends, is the full Monty. You can see how all the relevant derivatives flow directly from an understanding of the basic physiology. I hope you can appreciate why this is a tried and true board's favorite. And that'll do it. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact me or Dr. Evil at 12 Days. I'll catch up with you in the days ahead with the discussion of the glomerular disorders. Be cool.